It's uh, 2 11 p.m. Uh, on Thursday, the uh, 6th of December, 2007. I'm Mark Strassman in Los Angeles. I'm about to talk to Peter Meissen, who's in San Diego at the uh, Global Energy uh, Network Institute, where he's the, the president. Welcome uh, back to uh, Utopia News Channel. It's good, good to be back with you, Mark. Uh, to tell our new listeners and reiterate for our uh, previous ones uh, what uh, uh, Genie is exactly. Uh, Genie is a research institute, stands for, again, the Global Energy Network Institute, focused on the interconnection strategy of electrical grids between countries around the world. Uh, you could think of it ultimately as a worldwide web of electricity. It clearly gets built one piece at a time, uh, oftentimes across those borders. And just as importantly, tapping renewable energy resources, the big spectrum of wind, solar, hydro, geothermal around the world that's uh, oftentimes massively abundant but located in a remote location. So you need that transmission to bring it from where, it's, uh, from where we can generate it to where we really need it in our cities and our industry. Okay. Uh, I thought of you immediately after I heard about this desert tech project that's been proposed. Uh, why don't you tell our listeners uh, what desert tech is? Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how it fits into the uh, Gini uh, worldview. Uh, essentially, that's an initiative that's come out of the Middle East and North African nations, uh, supported by uh, clearly a, a headquarters, I'm going to say, in Jordan with some uh, German engineers bringing their expertise. But really, uh, um, I think an initiative that's looking, that looks at all of those uh, sun belt countries of North Africa and the Middle East and the, the enormous resource potential that's there. When you actually get into the studies, there's, a, uh, uh, there's enough solar potential just in a few, uh, a, a small footprint of those desert regions to power the needs of all of Europe, to power the needs of all of the Middle East today. Now, it would only be for daytime needs. And what you would want to do then is integrate that into a expanding transmission system, a grid system of high voltage AC, high voltage DC, to bring that to the marketplaces where, uh, uh, where are the major cities, not only for the Middle Eastern use, but they're looking at as an export uh, resource into Europe that would displace fossil fuel and deliver, uh, and deliver dollars back into the, uh, uh, into the Middle Eastern uh, community. Uh, so we're essentially talking about an, an OIC, a, an organization of ele electricity exporting countries. Uh, that would be a distinction from OPEC, wouldn't it? It would be an organization of electricity uh, producing and exporting company, countries. And if you're, if you're doing it with a renewable, which solar is, compared to fossil fuel, which will run out everywhere around the world, ultimately. Now, there are, uh, there are a whole lot more uh, barrels in the ground there than, are, than there are still in, in uh, most of the Western world. So they, by very nature of birth, they're blessed with that resource. But it is the most important... Uh, I think carbon chains that we have to use for higher value goods than just burning in our in our in our fuel in our transportation in our cars. So if we can keep that that fuel and bank it in the ground for a much longer period of time, and they can literally harvest the sun on a, on an ongoing basis every day. They can they can power their own electrical needs. They can hot heat their own water. They can desalinate water. And obviously, when they have excess, export that to other countries for export income. So, uh, so how does Genie feel about this project? Uh, we're very supportive. We actually just wrote a paper in this last few months that was similar. Uh, we took a slightly different tack on this because the the issue that's obviously cropping up in the Middle East right now is this uh, nuclear development, mostly driven by Iran. And with that, you saw or have seen. Uh, countries like Jordan and Egypt and Syria, probably others, considering a nuclear option as well. And I, uh, uh, I can't think of anything worse than all of those nations uh, going nuclear. And uh, it's, it's, it certainly can be used just for electricity production, but it's the, it's the first step to move toward a much riskier uh, uh, future if we do that. And they are, if you look at the cost, and that was essentially our, uh, our analysis, Comparing the costs of solar development and the risks of solar development compared to nuclear, uh, it certainly made a whole lot more sense with the, their uh, with their abundant solar resource in their deserts to to go down that path first. So, and, and in fact, it, it's not possible to uh, adapt uh, uh, solar technology to, for weapon uh, weapons purposes uh, the way I it is. 
nuclear. I think it'd be pretty difficult, and nobody was, wants to go uh, bomb a solar installation. There's not much uh, value added in that in terms of a strategic move that I can see. And uh, usually solar installations would be dispersed throughout a wide area in a desert region. So there's a, uh, I, I think it would have less, uh, less national security consequence to build that than you would have to with a nuclear power plant and all the protections that would have to go around that facility. And in fact, offensively, all you could really do is drop a solar panel on somebody's head, and that would be pretty inefficient as a, as a means that, of offensive warfare. Uh, that in fact, like a good weapon. what we're talking about, the, the Iranians argue that even though they have plentiful natural gas and oil deposits, that, that they realize that peak oil is coming, they're going to run out eventually, and they want new... Go ahead, I'm sorry. And, and they want nuclear to uh, fill in the gap. If something along the lines of the Desert Tech Project and other things like Gina is talking about created a, a renewable solar-based uh, source of electricity for the Middle East and North Africa, the Iranians, along with the other countries in the uh, area, would be able to rely on this renewable source of electricity to meet their needs as the oil ran out uh, w without the need to worry that the uranium will run out as well, wouldn't it? Well, it just it makes more sense while the, while we have just very high oil prices, and and you know all of these governments are just uh, swimming in profits literally right now. That they have an opportunity to, in to invest, and uh, doesn't it make more sense to invest in something that they know is going to be there? literally forever. The sun is always going to be shining in that part of the world. Uh, they have the money to put into that technology today. Uh, clearly the expertise and all the technical know-how exists already uh, for this. So bringing a few, uh, bringing that technical expertise and the resources together to really harvest that renewable resource today to extend the life and extend the life of that fossil fuel resource would be a much smarter long-term move. Okay, one last point. Um, the, uh, the Southern California ecosystem in which we both live uh, it, it really is a desert itself. Uh, would the um, uh, technology and the excitement and the um, uh, development that would be involved in this Desert Tech project have any spillover uh, or be able to take advantage of existing uh, systems that Californians are producing in terms of technology for export? to provide the technology for this system or to serve as a model for doing the same thing, say in Riverside, San Bernardino counties that have vast uh, wastelands of uh, empty space that could be just as fully utilized as uh, the Sahara or North African deserts? You're speaking exactly our song there. Singing our song, I guess, is the right, uh, right. Uh, acronym. That, uh, um, and Southern California is doing this and has some leadership role right now. There's a 300 megawatt solar, concentrated solar power facility. It's a long troughs of mirrors focused on tubes of oil. It gets really hot, uh, goes through a, a turbine and a heat exchanger and, and creates electricity. So that's being sold into the Southern California grid today. That's the exact same technology that we're talking about for the desert regions there. So it is it's easily transferable. Uh, this isn't a, um, this isn't some sort of proprietary expertise. There are several companies in the world that now are developing these concentrated solar power systems. Uh, Southern California is planning on expanding that resource to meet our renewable portfolio standards. We have to, to go up to 20 percent by, uh, I think it's 2010, and 30 percent by 2020, I believe is the number. And all of the utilities are starting to contract with large solar, large wind manufacturers in Southern California and Tehachapi for the wind. Uh, but it needs transmission. They've also started this, uh, this a new initiative called the California Renewable Energy Transmission Initiative because the, the grid that we have was built to access large fossil fuel resources whether or, and nuclear um, around the state. That's how we built it over the last 50 years. It wasn't built to access large wind and solar resources where they're located. So that's the, that's the, the nature of that new initiative is to, to support and enable our utilities to meet this new renewable portfolio standard and accelerate the ability to, to bring that transmission line to where we have abundant wind, abundant solar, and that we can all become much more green in our, in our power purchases. What's the status of that the transmission initiative right now? What can people do to learn more about it or get involved in supporting it? 
Uh, I would Google the California Renewable Energy Transmission Initiative. I think it's C A R E T I, and there's a, a a pretty good resource that's been published already on that. I think it was launched a couple of months ago, and it's a very important legislative move. And I don't want to call it legislative. Excuse me. It's a cooperative uh, committee amongst several agencies, regulatory regulatory bodies, and utilities to figure out how to get through the roadblocks of really accessing these large wind and large solar sites that are that are huge in our in our southern california desert but the again the system wasn't built to tap those resources the system was built as it was around the world to access fossil fuel nuclear large hydro so there's needs to be a shift in our underlying platform of transmission and hopefully that initiative will will help uh, push that forward and building a new system like that or expanding the existing system would provide an opportunity to use new technologies such as superconducting transmitters, uh, uh, transmission lines that would uh, uh, be another uh, uh, more efficient link between the production and the use of the electricity, wouldn't it? If we can get to superconducting transmission, then then we're talking about literally interconnecting things around the world because then whatever uh, whatever power you put into a system on the other side of the planet is exactly the same amount that you can take out without any losses whatsoever so then you can keep all generators running 24 hours a day for maximum efficiency uh, we're a long way away from from ambient temperature superconductors but it has been used and developed for very small short uh, short distance needs uh, we'll need a we'll need a few more breakthroughs, I think, before we get to using superconductors above ground uh, to move the kind of bulk power that we want today. Okay, but uh, I, I want to put that out there as a goal. Maybe it needs its own X Prize uh, to to get uh, uh, long long distance uh, superconductivity uh, uh, up and running. Uh, what, what, let me, but, but let me let me jump in and make sure that that we don't make a misnomer here. That that's not needed. As a as a breakthrough here, Southern California's cheapest electricity comes from Bonneville Power Administration, uh, essentially about a thousand miles away, falling water from the Columbia River down the Pacific Intertie. There's two AC lines, one DC line, so that's that's within that's within the economic and efficient transmission range of the technology today to buy two percent water, two percent you know per kilowatt hour falling water to put in and I'm willing to buy that when I say I that the two utilities in Southern California are willing to buy that and put it into our grid system and and it's actually some of our cheapest power here in Southern California okay speaking of water and electricity it's not just North Africa and the Middle East that could use more water so could Southern California and with cheap plentiful solar generated electricity it would in fact be possible to ship that electricity to the coast desalinate water and pump it inland wouldn't it Exactly. There's a, there's the next benefit that you just addressed that we and 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 really all I don't want to say all most people in the world live within a few miles of water. It's just the nature of of humans and settlements. So the bulk of humanity lives either near some river, some stream, some ocean within a a, a reasonable distance. When you actually look at our population distribution around the world, so the idea that you now have clean electricity becoming coming to those areas and being used to keep the lights on when you have excess you can now essentially crack water hydro uh, electrolyze water capture the hydro capture the hydrogen and use it for transportation sector or use the electricity for the the new fleets of uh, uh, chargeable uh, cars that are coming down the pike literally. the idea the ideal car truck system um, will probably move through a stage of plug-in hybrids and and diesel power but the ideal would be electrical transportation and uh, and that that hydrogen fuel because when you burn that in a fuel cell or as a combustible all you get out of the tailpipe is steam Okay, so uh, how does all this look from where you're sitting there at, uh, at Genie? And, and uh, it, it looks like even just in the few months since we last talked, things seem to be moving along uh, uh, at an accelerating pace, aren't they? They definitely are. We just were in the world at the World Energy Conference in Rome just two weeks ago, came back. And I think the, the, the biggest shift that, that clearly was evident is they have five huge trade halls there. This is the uh, this is where the energy ministers, the the big u the big utilities of the world, all the engineering firms that are doing business globally come and showcase their wares for the very first time. Uh, Twenty percent of the exhibit halls of the of the five halls, one of them was dedicated to renewables, and that was a huge shift 
that that occurred in this last three years because that they only meet once every three years. So there, so there is a lot of hope. Yes. Thank you very much for uh, talking about it, and I hope we can talk again in more detail as this project and others that you're involved with uh, come to fruition or at least move closer to that point. Mark, thanks very much. Talk to you later. Bye.